Wild Laboratories is privileged to present Out of Darkness, produced in consultation with the American Psychiatric Association and the National Association of Mental Health, with Dr. William C. Manninger as medical narrator and starring Orson Welles as the reader. isolated on the plain, or companioned by thousands in the forest, bears within its bark all the materials for rapid combustion. For all so cool and green as it looks, the elements of its destruction are circling through it, through branch and trunk, leaf and root. Between the tree and the fire, and man and madness, a close analogy exists. Then they part. The fire must come to the tree. Man can go and seek madness, can toil and pray and suffer, and as it were, go a courting this fearful bride. And numberless are the paths which lead to the region of darkness in which she dwells. exception of myself and I'm not going to do any acting. I'm just going to read to you a few pages from a book now and then. We're going to make a journey through the world of mental disorder. It's a world which is unknown, feared by most of us, but not nearly so desolate of hope as we might imagine. One of our guides will be this book that I'm going to read from. It's quite a remarkable book written over a hundred years ago by an unknown man, a former patient in a mental hospital in Glasgow, Scotland. Our other guide will be a doctor, Dr. William Menninger, one of America's foremost psychiatrists. Through these two voices, one from the present, one from the past, perhaps we'll be able to gain some measure of insight into one of the most urgent health problems of our time into that vast and greatly misunderstood portion of humanity, the mentally ill. And now from the book. I am not a medical man. My claim to be heard is founded not upon education or position, but solely upon what I've seen, and what I've suffered. For 17 years, I've been in communication with insanity. And for a long time, I've been impressed with the idea that could this disease be rendered more familiar, and of course, less repulsive to the public mind. Its chance of being checked and subdued in the first stage would be much greater in the hope of dissipating this dread and freeing the bright spirit of hope from the talons of despair, I've written this little book. And while keeping truth in view, I've endeavored to strip lunatic asylums of all imaginary terrors and to render them familiar to the public view.
Lunacy, like rain, falls alike upon the evil and the good. And although it must forever be a fearful misfortune, yet there is no more sin or shame in it than there is in rheumatism or a fever. the certainty of an attack of insanity before me and the power to prescribe for myself I'd say put me in a place where I can do no harm to myself or any other person and let that place not be a prison in which penance must be undergone and punishment suffered but let it be a place of refuge an asylum I'm glad you came in because I've been wanting to talk to you about your wife's illness. Did you notice when her illness started? Yes, I did, about three months before I taken her to the hospital. Mm -hmm. I noticed strange things happened about her, and uh, I got so bad that I was afraid to leave her by herself mm -hmm. while I was working, you know. What did your wife do when you, you first noticed she was getting upset? I noticed her doing strange, uh, strange things, such as uh, sitting at the window from morning till night and not dressing uh, at all. And uh, I would talk to her and she wouldn't answer. And uh, in fact, one day that uh, the neighbors told me that she went out in the nude. Mm -hmm. And one of the neighbors caught her just in time as she was crossing the street and brought her back in. And they uh, was kind of ashamed to let me know anything about it. And. Uh, when I went to pay the rent to my landlady, why, she told me about it. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really began worrying. Mm -hmm. And another thing that uh, made it seem strange, that she was had the Bible in her hand from morning till night, which she never did do before. And I would come home at night, and she'd point out verses to me. Mm -hmm. And she would write notes, you know, and lay in the, uh, different pages of the Bible that she had written down. Mm -hmm. And she would, uh, she was always talking about the stars and moon and stuff like that, you know. And uh, I knew then that something was wrong, but I didn't, couldn't catch it right away. I understand Doris is mute now that she won't talk to anyone. Was she a talkative person before her illness? Very talkative. She used to be pleasant and, and uh, joyful, you know, and always singing around the house, you know, and uh, well, she always done something to occupy her mind can make friends with anybody. She had some friends that uh, came to the house quite often and she would just sit there and have a wonderful time with them. And uh, when I noticed her getting into this stage, uh, she didn't recognize these same people that she had had a lot of fun with and talked to earlier. It was a hard decision to decide on sending her to this hospital. I'll say it was. And I was just wondering if that should, uh, if that will be held against me when she does come home. Many patients, when they come here, have some resentment about coming, but as they begin to feel better, quite often they realize that coming here was for their own good and their own happiness in the long run. Yes, ma'am. I know you'll worry about it, though, until that time comes. I do.
There's nothing to be afraid of in here. Let's just look around. Would you like to look at some of the books? Why don't you just sit down and be comfortable? Does it make you feel better to hold my hand? You can if you want. I'll give you a cigarette before I leave. I'll be right out in the hall. I'll wait for you there.
only want to understand you and to help you while you try to understand yourself. This is a place where you can't hurt anyone and no one can hurt you. A safe place. A place where you can do what you want and I will understand. Try very hard to understand, that is. these symptoms spring. A reason so powerful in its irrationality as to shake the sufferer almost beyond endurance. And there is a long chapter in the book of human nature, unread by one who would judge an insane person solely by her behavior. From a technical point of view, we know that all of us do have mental devices, tricks in a sense, that work automatically, that try to relieve us when we have a feeling of fear or anxiety or tension. We all of them use, we all of us use these too. When the world going gets rough for any of us, we at times all use one or two major methods of combating the situation. One of them is flight. We'll take flight from it in one way or another, by procrastination or forgetting or neglect, or perhaps going to sleep or running off physically, sometimes maybe getting sick. And the other reaction is the fight reaction, reaction in which sometimes we threaten and even destroy the situation that we want so much to save. We get angry, we blow our top, we get so mad that we don't uh, think what we're doing and we destroy the situation. All of us do that sometimes. Life's full of stress for all of us. And for some people, goes on too long and is too heavy, they begin to bend and they break. And that's what happened to these patients. When we see them here, their action and behavior seems bizarre and strange to us. But really, it's just their attempted solution using the same devices that we use to find a happy way out, but it's so unhappy. And now the job is to help them find a better solution. And that's the assignment that the doctor in the hospital takes on when they come to us. As a flood of fire from the bosom of a living volcano sweeps down the verdant slope, turning flower and fruit into smoke and ashes, so does insanity sweep over laughter and happiness. And where those glorious attributes once flourished, we find only desolation and darkness. Yet I may add for the consolation of the afflicted and their friends that the coming of insanity need not permanently injure either the feelings or the intelligence. In the great majority of cases, provided proper treatment is resorted to at the outset, 
it is curable. If there was room for optimism a hundred years ago, there's room for much more optimism now about the cure of mental illness. I don't believe any group of illnesses have the potential recovery rate that mental illness does. The tragedy is that because of the lack of doctors and facilities, that many patients don't have a chance to have the right treatment. What do I mean by the right treatment? Well, those that know a little about it have heard of shock, electric, and insulin. These are applicable in perhaps 5 to 10% of cases. And then a new door has been opened with the advent of drugs, the so-called tranquilizing drugs. They the whole much promise to, but they're not a cure-all. They're not going to radically change the situation because at best they just help the patient become accessible to help. Help him be able to talk, help him participate in the program of the hospital. Actually, they're both the drugs and the shock treatment are comparatively unimportant to the role of the hospital as a whole. The hospital has to provide, in a sense, protection for a patient. Protection sometimes from himself. Certainly protection from those waves that have engulfed him. It has to do this in various ways in its physical setup. It has to do it in a program of activities. Opportunities where the patient can express his interests can perhaps learn new interests. And that's why in psychiatric institutions, we have to have a program that includes classes, perhaps, in music, and art, maybe even typewriting, social events, games of all kinds, lots of different crafts. Quite apart, though, from the hospital and its physical setup, the most important thing are the people that work in that hospital. Those people have to be trained. They have to be taught the meaning of mental illness so that they have a rationale to be patient and tolerant and helpful. Most of all, if a patient gets well in a mental institution, it's because of personalities that surround him, the people that will help him. The doctor is kind of the captain of the crew. He's the fellow that's got to find out what's wrong with the individual and what ought to be done about it, what ought to be prescribed for the patient and plan the program in the hospital. More important, perhaps, are his personal contacts with the patient. His contacts as a guide, as an interpreter, as a person who understands and will help the patient understand. The individual who has got to guide the patient, if he can, back to help. And very often this occurs in frequent, regular sessions with the patient, what technically we call psychotherapy. Doris, you may sit down whenever you like. really can help you to decide when you're a little less afraid in here it will be easier to decide at the moment it seems to me Doris you're feeling tight frozen holding yourself in so you won't get hurt anymore You know, Doris, that I want to help. But I think you can't be sure if you can trust me. If I'll stand by you when you need me, and if I remain willing to help, I will. my residence in the asylum. My wife visited me upon a stated day each week, and no week passed without her seeing me. 
though I was often unable to let her know at the time, these visits gave me something to think upon, being, as it were, a solid spot in a troubled ocean where on the spirit could occasionally rest. <laughs> Doris, did you like the magazines I brought you? Will you read some more if I bring you some? Yes, you find all those cactus roots. Oh, just uh, for one minute. Yeah. Don't you talk to me, honey. Hmm? How do you think I feel when I hear your voice? Don't you think it makes me happy? Don't it? Don't you think it makes me happy to hear your voice? And you gotta make up your mind, Doris. You gotta make up your mind, Angel. To get your mind off these other people, and you got your life to live. Don't forget that. life are you living? Maybe that's the trouble. You're not living your life. You're living somebody else's life. Tell her someone asked you. I'm going to tell you something now. You ever see the little place I got now? It's the only damn reason in the world I got it, Doris. You could come home and really fix it up some nice. I got a nice little living room. I got a bedroom, twin beds. I got a nice bathroom kitchen and I bought a television set what do you think I'm doing that for not for me honey I'm not doing it for me I don't give a damn when I just have a, a floor to sleep on I want you to get one come on will you get well will you get well Decide whether. 
do you want that help? Wyeth Laboratories is presenting Out of Darkness, produced in consultation with the American Psychiatric Association and the National Association for Mental Health, with Dr. William C. Menninger as medical narrator and starring Orson Welles as the reader. We continue now with part two of Out of Darkness. No position can be more honorable than that of a conscientious and humane physician who devotes his time and talents to the treatment of the insane. And what a fearful responsibility clings to the office which he has assumed. For in many cases it lies with him whether the patient be saved or lost. Progress summary, Doracell, third week of treatment. The patient's acceptance of my comb and her desire to take it back to the ward with her are clear indications that she accepts the idea of help and of a doctor. Her previous terror is gone, and in general, she seems to be much more relaxed and comfortable. However, there is still a considerable amount of anxiety present. Each effort of mine to achieve closer contact presents a new threat to her. And in this formative stage of our relationship, there are still many things which she is not yet prepared to accept. Would you be less frightened if I held your hand? Don't take my hand if it will make you uncomfortable.
progress summary, Doracell, sixth week of treatment. The most significant development over the last few interviews has been an increase in the patient's response to the external environment. becomes more alert to her surroundings, I find that I am beginning to get a clearer sense of the woman beneath the illness. Enjoying the twilight and the beauty, and the fragrance of the trees, who in other places would still be lying in barns and darkness. beneficial, especially if attendants or other sane people can be involved in the enterprise. It breaks up that stagnation of the mind consequent upon the monotony which must ever reign within these walls. Thank you. 
aside for the time from the corroding task of contemplating its own sorrows. Progress summary. Doris L. Tenth week of treatment. Non-verbal contact has been firmly established. It is now time to encourage her to talk. And now this attack on the defense of muteness will undoubtedly increase her anxiety and it may lead to a setback. However, I feel it's a risk worth taking. to understand, but sometimes I can't understand unless you tell me in words. I want to help answer your questions if you feel that you can ask them now. Questions that you may have about being in a hospital. You know you're in a hospital, Doris. This is a hospital. And I'm your doctor. It's not easy when you decide to remove yourself from people. Once it's done, it's even harder to get close to them again, isn't it? I somehow feel that there are things you would like to let me know, but you don't know how. You still have to prevent yourself. you hear, Doris?
pearl. Is that a real pearl? I don't know. You like pretty things, no? Mm -hmm. I had some pearls. of the patient into reality, the first major stage of treatment is over. We're ready now to utilize our relationship in order to help her understand herself and her illness, and also to give her support as she moves into new areas of experience. Some will say, though she appears pretty well now, were she to leave this, who knows, but she might relapse. No doubt she would like to return to the world, but many there would distrust and despise her. No one does so here. However, it is in the busy avenues of men, not in the solitude and shelter of the asylum, that the cure must be perfected.
This was an amazing experience. We watched a real patient with a real doctor in a real hospital with a real husband get well, a seriously mentally ill patient. But in a sense, this has created an illusion, maybe. An illusion that I'd like to try to correct if I can. Because I feel so deeply in my heart the suffering and the unhappiness of 750,000 patients in our hospitals in this country. And not a handful of them are getting the treatment that this patient did. Why? Because in that big population, the size of the city of Pittsburgh, there's only one doctor for every 311 patients. What chance would Doris have had if she was one patient among 310 others with one doctor? We're trying to run these hospitals on the ridiculous sum of two dollars and a half a day per patient. And that includes the board and the room and the clothing and the medical attention. You and I know that it costs 10 times this amount 15 times this amount to go to a general hospital. What, we can, what can we expect in this field of mental health if we're going to try to do that kind of a job two and a half a day? And furthermore, we're starving to death in our field of psychiatry for more knowledge. We ought to be able to help these people more quickly. We ought to be going much further And how do we prevent mental illness. And yet research in psychiatry is a drop in the bucket to the need. It's the biggest cost of all the health problems, a billion, two hundred million dollars a year. And we don't spend one half of one percent learning how to do our job better in this rich land across the country. Where did we could enlist people's understanding of how big this problem is, how neglected, how backward we are in our knowledge of what ought to be done so that many, many girls like this could get well. The facts are that six out of every ten people that go to a mental hospital never leave it. And that doesn't have to be. We've got proof now and can show it that at least eight out of every ten could go home and again be happy and useful citizens. This is a universal problem. It affects us all. It ought to be a concern of every individual as to what can he do about it. So many places need help. They need financial support. They need clear and better understanding. And only as more people do understand is there going to be change. I have a deep conviction that when people know and understand, it will be changed. Wyeth Laboratories has been privileged to present Out of Darkness, a CBS public affairs program produced in consultation with the American Psychiatric Association and the National Association for Mental Health.